Good evening, everybody. Thanks for coming back. Welcome, uh, welcome back from this morning. Um, just wanted to announce a couple of things for the youth group. Next week, we are having our costume party, 6.30 to 8.30. We have some games planned. Um, a cartoon we'll be watching and some fun activities, maybe some uh, something invo involving some pumpkins, so that'll be fun. Um, also... You guys are not aware, we have um, the, the winter retreat coming up in February, February 2nd through the 4th, um, so keep your eyes out for, for uh, more details on that. And lastly, I will open us up in prayer, and then I'll walk, welcome Dr. Tom Hoyle up to the stage. Father, thank you, uh, thank you for Tom. Dr. Tom, and, and the last 38 years of ministry that he has uh, provided to this area, Lord, to, to countless people. Um, thank you for his honesty, Lord, that he wants to dig into your word and compare it to the world, um, the ways that he uh, um, relies on your spirit, Lord, and, and digs into, again, your word and, um, and finds the truths that are, that are there. Pray for this evening, Lord, you'd open our hearts, um, open, our, open our eyes, Lord, and uh, wake us up, Lord, if we're exhausted, give us sharp minds to be able to pay attention to um, and hear from Tom, and uh, lastly, Lord, bless Tom tonight in his message. In my prayer, amen. Yeah, right, right. Good evening. I'm impressed that you're here tonight. Uh, for those I haven't met before, my name is Tom Hoyle with Bible and Science Ministries, and since 1985, back in Jurassic period, um, since then, I've been speaking in churches and schools and colleges about the wonderful accuracy of God's word, especially in terms of history, archaeology, and science. And uh, we've been privileged to go ahead and speak in all 50 states and five foreign countries, again, about the wonderful accuracy of the word of God. However, as some of you know, for 35 years, I served in the Air Force Reserve, and I began sharing programs for military audiences about America's spiritual heritage. If you'll pardon the pun, uh, this all evolved out of my uh, trips to Washington, D.C., my time in the Library of Congress, as well as my time throughout all of New England, and I was just astounded. And so we now have eight different programs about America's spiritual heritage. God has been very, very busy, folks, in our country. And don't get me wrong, I'm the first one to tell you our country's got serious problems, right? But God founded this country. God's been using this country. And I do not think he's quite done with our country yet. Indeed, we have a program on 14 spiritual reasons why you can still love America, all right? Indeed, and I think I'll say this in the program, I think there's still some spiritual tread left on America's tires that God can use if we can keep on keeping on for him, all right? And today, as you might know, this evening, we'd like to look at nine extraordinary individuals that we believe they were used by God, especially because of the power of prayer. Then at the end, dun, 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 
We're going to have the quiz. And electronic quiz contest, we're going to have 10 victims, I mean 10 volunteers, five guys and five gals. You don't know who you are yet. You will. We're mainly going to have teenagers, but I'm not surprised at all if they decide to have one or two adults on each side, one or two uh, college age on each side, one or two high schoolers and junior high schoolers, you get what I'm trying to say, and you'll get to come up here and engage in intellectual combat. No, Christians don't exercise combat. Anyway, we'll have five guys versus five girls to exploit sexual hostility and find out who is smarter in your church, guys or gals, okay? We've been doing a quiz contest now for 28 years. I have found out there's nothing quite like guys versus gals, okay? And we're going to ask about 20 questions. These questions will have answers in the program that you're about to see. So everybody here should get 100% on our quiz, theoretically, all right? And again, we'll see who's more intelligent in your church. We'll hand out points, we'll hand out prizes, we'll hand out candy, okay? So we hope everybody pays attention, especially young people will be picking you first, okay? But um, at any rate, we also have a resource table. As I said this morning, we bring the books and discs for two reasons. Number one, many of the books and discs are hard to get. In fact, some of them are out of print, which, well, grieves me greatly. And then uh, secondly, we do discount these as much as possible. My favorite book about America's spiritual heritage is by Newt Gingrich. Doesn't matter what somebody thinks about him. He's a very good writer, and he has a PhD in history, and he loves God. Rediscovering God in America. I love this book. The most helpful book is by a friend of mine, William Federer, America's God in Country. It's sort of a mini encyclopedia about God in action in America. My favorite section is the 32-page section on the bulletproof George Washington. And then, may I ask, how many here know of Michael Medved? Okay, a number of you. Uh, technically speaking, he's an Orthodox Jew. He loves Christians. Christians love him. And he came out with a two-volume set regarding God in action in our country. Here's volume one, The American Miracle, which goes from the colonial times to the Civil War. And then volume two, of course, is after that. Uh, after, uh, as far as the DVDs are concerned, William Federer came out with four different DVDs. Each one has 10 different stories about God in action, and then probably the best-selling DVD of all time about America and uh, our, our spiritual heritage, it's America's Godly Heritage by David Barton. Hey, so much for all that. We want to thank you for coming here today. Let me go ahead and get my act together, and we will get started. We also hope to have time for your Q&A at the evening, too, okay? All righty, and then if we can have the lights, please. All right, there we go, great, thank you. Okay, godly tough guys and gals in American history. Let's start off, folks, with the bulletproof general. George Washington became almost as famous for being on his knees in prayer as he was on his horse in combat. George Washington said, it is the duty of all nations to acknowledge the providence of Almighty God, to obey his will, to be grateful for his benefits, and humbly implore his protection and favor. George Washington knew what he was talking about. Indeed, George Washington, historians note, was in combat at least 30 times. He was usually in the thick of it. In eight of those battles you see listed there, historians believe he should have been killed. How he survived all eight of those battles is absolutely astonishing. And as you can see, I refer to this as Washington's Nine Lives. After the Monongahela Massacre, which is by far the most famous of all the times when he should have been killed, after that, he wrote his brother, and he said, but by blind luck, is that what he said? But by providence, I have been protected beyond all human probability or expectation, for I had four bullets through my coat and two horses shot under me, yet escaped unhurt. By the way, his hat was shot off twice. Monongahela Massacre, we talk a lot more about that. And of course, if anybody has any questions, we can talk about whatever uh, at the end of our program or in the resource area. That's the most famous. However, Washington thought he came the closest to dying at the Battle of Fort Duquesne, which also occurred during the French and Indian War. Then in Revolutionary War, his first real close escape was at Kipps Bay. 
After the Delaware River crossing, historians note that he should have been killed during the Battle of Trenton. My personal favorite example, which we can discuss during Q&A if you want, the Battle of Princeton. I think hands down, it is indisputable evidence of divine protection of him. He was almost killed during the Battle of Brandywine, the Battle of Monmouth, and at the Battle of Yorktown. Regarding George Washington, President Calvin Coolidge was a big fan and expert, and he said, thank the divine providence which kept him to serve and inspire his fellow man. I'm not an expert, but I've read nine biographies about George Washington. One of the latest ones, and these are all by secular people, Ron Chernow admitted, even as a young man, Washington seemed to possess a magical immunity to bullets. This led one Indian chief to predict that some higher power was guiding him to great events in the future. If you're ever in Washington, D.C., in the Capitol, and they'll let you look, there's a prayer room in the U.S. Capitol. There's a beautiful stained glass window depicting Washington in prayer with his favorite verse from Psalm 16, verse 1. Preserve me, O God, for in thee do I put my trust. Was Washington a Christian? Well, in our schools today, they would say, no way. Well, I don't know about that. For example, in his prayer journal, George Washington wrote the following, wash away my sins in the immaculate blood of the Lamb and purge my heart by thy Holy Spirit. Daily frame me more and more into the likeness of thy Son, Jesus Christ. Thou gavest thy Son to die for me and hast given me assurance of salvation. What do you think? There are three major books about George Washington's faith, just his faith. The biggest one is called Sacred Fire, almost 1,200 pages, and I read almost every single one. The author concludes, the only legitimate conclusion that can be drawn from this evidence is that Washington was an advocate of and a believer in the Christian faith. Many of our founding fathers were very godly folks. Many of them were outright Christians. In school, they teach that all of our founding fathers were deists. We've talked about this before. I don't think so. A deist back then was somebody who believed in God as a creator, and then basically he walked away. Folks, even Benjamin Franklin and Thomas Jefferson were big on the power of prayer, and no deist believed in prayer, which means virtually none of our founding fathers were deists. But that's for another time. We've got to move on. And I know people, they complain that we don't spend enough time on each of these. Well, if we did, you'd be here for three hours, okay? We do cover each of these in other programs in more detail. For the sake of time, let's move on from the Bulletproof General to two naval heroes. In a different program, we talk about the Battle of Washington, D.C. that occurred during the War of 1812. Today, may we make mention of the Battle of Lake Erie. His name was Oliver Hazard Perry. He was a young American officer, a commander, and he was given impossible orders. He was to raise up an American fleet on Lake Erie and stop the world's biggest navy. That's all. No pressure. His newlywed wife, Elizabeth, was not happy about this. She tearfully hugged her husband goodbye, and she promised him, I will pray for you constantly. My friends and relatives, we will pray for you constantly. We're glad that they were praying. The American forces and British forces collided on September 10th, 1813. The Americans fought long and hard, but there was no chance. They were extremely inexperienced. They were outnumbered and outgunned. One by one, Perry's ships were knocked out of action. His flagship, USS Lawrence, was set ablaze. He had no choice. He abandoned ship. The survivors and Perry rowed across in an open boat half a mile in enemy-held waters under constant enemy fire. Nobody expected to survive. They did. They made it to the last major surviving warship, the USS Niagara. However, they weren't too thrilled because they all knew by the end of the day there was no hope they would either be dead or captured. Instead, something stunning occurred. The wind shifted direction and with great force. Perry recovered from his surprise and he gave the order to attack. Sailing at flank speed, the USS Niagara 
plowed into the middle of the entire enemy flotilla. Every gun was blazing. She began firing full broadsides simultaneously in both directions at once. The USS Niagara sliced through the enemy fleet with hardly a scratch. But the enemy's three biggest warships were set ablaze, and the Niagara was only getting started. She came about for another attack run, and the wind still favored her. The British fleet was completely becalmed. They couldn't move a foot. The British commander was a brave, experienced officer who had served under Lord Nelson at the Battle of Trafalgar against Napoleon. He had never seen anything like this. One Yankee vessel was coming down against his ships again, and he couldn't move. He was helpless. He did the unthinkable. For the first time in the history of the Royal Navy, one of her officers gave the order to surrender. The British struck her colors. Perry contacted his superior and reported, we have met the enemy and they are ours. As you can imagine, Perry became an international hero. He had beaten the British Navy. He was 28 years old. Today, the US Navy honors the memory of Oliver Hazard Perry with the Perry class frigate. But before Congress, Perry, he put credit where credit was due. And he said, it is pleased the almighty to give the arms of the United States a signal victory over their enemies on this lake. But right after the battle itself, Perry got in front of his cheering men on the Niagara. He wiped the tears and the sweat and the dirt and the soot out of his eyes. And he said, the prayers of my wife are answered. By the way, folks, do you know there are now three books about women in prayer? So guys, we better watch out. <laughs> With God, all things are possible. But next, moving on, we turn to Jedediah's journeys. His name, Jedediah Smith, famous American mountain man, cartographer or map maker, and missionary. He had a whole lot of adventures, folks. He survived two Indian massacres, was in all kinds of skirmishes. He's most famous, though, for his dealings with a grizzly bear. He and two colleagues were in the Rocky Mountains. They were attacked by a grizzly. Long story short, Jedediah Smith he wound up with his head inside the bear's jaws. He somehow extricated himself. And ladies, please forgive me, but I, you know, I'm trying to keep this polite. Folks, he managed to get his head out of that very bad place, but in doing so, almost his entire scalp and one ear were almost completely torn off. He puts the top of his head back on, he keeps himself conscious and gave instructions to his colleagues how to sew the top of his head back together. For the rest of his life, he had a scar that went all the way around his head, almost all the way around, and it was one quarter to one half inch wide. He wound up looking like a beatnik because he would comb all of his hair over to the worst side <laughs> to minimize people seeing that horrible scar. Now, folks, if that isn't a tough guy, I don't know what a tough guy is. But you know what? He was a very devout Christian. He did not swear. He rarely drank. He was sexually moral, and he was famous for carrying the journal of Lewis and Clark and a Bible. He would see more of the West than almost any other American would for 50 years. He saw more than Lewis and Clark did. And he's given a credit for opening up the Oregon Trail. More and more historians are rediscovering Jedediah Smith more and more books and films and articles are coming out about him. On TV, uh, they have uh, two series of films. One is in the History Channel called America, The Story of Us, and it very favorably depicts the Christian testimony of Jedediah Smith. And then there's another series called Into the West, and uh, they have an entire episode on Jedediah Smith. And there have been other places where he's been less than dignified in his presentation. <laughs> I was surprised in LA on Wilshire Boulevard, it came across a monument to Jedediah Smith. And it indicated that he was an explorer, a fur trader, and a missionary. There are more and more things named after Jedediah Smith. One of the, my favorite places to visit regarding this time period is Fort Vancouver. And he spent a great deal of time there. I ask how many here have been to Fort Vancouver? Anybody? Is that a cool place or what? And it's only about, uh, what, about two hours from here, something like that? 
And very historic, very interesting place to visit. Or at the end of the Oregon Trail, I took this picture. Jedediah Smith had three ambitions, to serve his God, to provide for his family, and to become a great American explorer. In all three things, he succeeded. In his journal, Jedediah Smith wrote, how often ought we on our bended knees to offer our grateful acknowledgments for the gift of his dear son? Is it possible that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son? One of his favorite verses, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. But once more, folks, regrettably, have to move on. People say, can't you say more about that? Well, again, we'd be here for three hours. <laughs> so we move on, folks, to Chamberlain's Charge. Abraham Lincoln would become almost as famous for prayer as George Washington, and of course, that turned out to be a very good thing. Before, after Gettysburg, the battle in 1863 of the Civil War, Lincoln wrote, I asked God to help us and give us victory now. I'm sure my prayer was answered. I had no misgiving about the result at Gettysburg. Well, God apparently used a very unlikely person, folks, in a very dramatic way. He was a geek. He was a college professor named Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain. He actually trained a minister. Excuse me. <coughs> I'm all choked up. Pardon me. Oh, thank you. His wife did not want to be a pastor's wife, so he wound up being a college professor. But because of his Christian convictions against slavery, etc., he decided to become commissioned in the Union Army. He rose up through the ranks and he became the commanding colonel of the 20th Maine Regiment. Well, he had already seen extensive action, and his unit was whittled down due to casualties from 1,000 men down to 300. His superiors thought he had a full regiment when he didn't, and he was given impossible orders too. He was ordered to hold a small mountain known as a Little Round Top on the far left flank of the Union position. That was considered to be the most important real estate on earth. Whoever held the little round top was going to win the Battle of Gettysburg and probably win the Civil War. Well, he was told to hold that hill at all costs, period, down to the last man. Our Confederate friends, they wanted that hill. And they attacked Chamberlain's position a total of five times with overwhelming force. After uh, the battle... Chamberlain noted that his favorite verse was, with us is the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battles. It's fairly well depicted in the film, the miniseries of uh, Gettysburg by Ted Turner. At any rate, after the fourth attack, and this is correct, his sergeant major came up to him and said, sir, we cannot hold against another attack. We're almost out of ammunition. And Chamberlain said, you're right, we can't hold it. And his sergeant said, well, sir, we have to withdraw. No, we have our orders. We cannot withdraw. Well, sir, there's no other option except for surrender. No, we can't surrender. Well, sir, what do you have in mind? We're going to attack. And that was a terribly unlikely thing to do in their position. But Chamberlain personally led a desperate bayonet charge. And it worked. It caught the 15th Alabama Regiment completely off guard. But at the beginning of his charge a Confederate captain pointed his trusty 36 caliber Colt revolver six feet away from Chamberlain's chest and pulled the trigger. Nothing happened. He pulled the trigger again. Nothing happened. After the battle, Chamberlain recovered the revolver and it worked perfectly. This historian wrote, if there truly was a moment in which the outcome of the Civil War hinged, it occurred on Little Round Top when Joshua Chamberlain organized a defense and defeated attacking Confederates in hand-to-hand -hand fighting. As a result, Chamberlain was decorated with the Medal of Honor. He would eventually be promoted to the rank of Major General after seeing extensive service and being wounded five times. After the war, he'd be elected the governor of Maine twice, and he'd be likewise selected as the president of Bowdoin College, where he used to teach. Chamberlain was an extremely devout Christian, and he said things like, my heart and mind are at peace. Jesus Christ is my all-sufficient Savior. I can trust my own life and the welfare of my family in the hands of providence. I believe in a destiny 
divinely appointed. What about Abraham Lincoln? Was he a Christian? Again, we'll let you decide. He said, I was not a Christian, but when I went to Gettysburg and saw the graves of thousands of our soldiers, I then and there consecrated myself to Christ. Yes, I do love Jesus. Since we're talking about the Civil War, which is, we should say a word about the battlefield angel. Up until the Civil War, nursing was extremely medieval. Military medicine was even worse. We're very grateful to people like Florence Nightingale, who tried to make a difference. And in America, we owe great debt to Clara Barton. Clara Barton is considered to be one of the founders of military nursing. Clara Barton was known as the angel of the battlefield, the American Nightingale, Courageous Clara, or my personal favorite, Bulletproof Barton. The thing is, folks, Clara Barton wasn't content with working in a hospital far from the battlefield. Clara Barton usually was right there in the thick of it with bullets flying. It was not unusual for her to patch up bullet holes in her dress after a battle. She saw action, literally, in a number of American Civil War battles, some very bad ones, especially at Fredericksburg and in Antietam. And then after the war, she went overseas to help wounded soldiers. If you're ever in the Washington, D.C. area, I really recommend you visit Fredericksburg. Uh, it's extremely impressive how they've tried to preserve the battlefield. And folks, there is still standing there a mansion that dates back to revolutionary times. That mansion was the field hospital of Clara Barton. And even Abraham Lincoln would stay there at that hospital. There was a controversy about Clara Barton. Soldiers asked the question, Clara Barton's bulletproof. She can't be killed. So the safest place to be during a battle is next to her. And then other soldiers said, no, you got it all wrong. She's bulletproof, and the bullets that miss her will hit you instead. <laughs> so it's best to stay away from Clara Barton. I don't know that that particular controversy has ever been resolved. <laughs> I'm reminded of that verse, a thousand shall fall at thy side and 10,000 at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Years later, he was a very devout Christian. President William McKinley heard about Clara Barton, and he said, we are constantly reminded of our obligations to divine master for his watchful care. Clara Barton wrote things like, in her journal, Christ teach my soul a prayer that would plead to the Father for grace sufficient. God pity and strengthen everyone. Thy will, O God, be done. And among other things, she'd become famous for being the founder of the American Red Cross. Regarding the Red Cross, Woodrow Wilson later would say, this cross, which these ladies bear, is an emblem of Christianity itself. And of course, many things have been named after Clara Barton in her honor, and some outstanding books like this one are available. But next, as we promised this morning, we now turn to the Hillbilly Hero. A number of years ago, American high school students were asked, who is their greatest American fighting hero of all time? This is really, really embarrassing, folks. Do you know who they picked? Rambo. <laughs> dum dee dum 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 Here's a newsflash. Young people, he's fictitious. He didn't live. And guess what? Compared to our real hero, he was a wuss. A real hero, folks, very unlikely person, Sergeant Alvin C. York, U.S. Army. Alvin York was a hillbilly, a hick, from the backwards of Tennessee. My mother was likewise from Virginia, West Virginia, and we mentioned Cecil Richardson this morning, likewise from West Virginia. This man was quite a character, folks. He was more of a hick than even the Beverly Hillbillies. And... He was known for being a horrible person. He was a heavy drinker. He was a brawler. He'd break up church services by firing off his shotgun outside. But his mother never stopped praying for him, and he got saved. Boy, did he get saved. He got so saved, he gave up firearms, became a pacifist. Wow. We're reminded of that famous verse, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Alvin York became a pacifist, a conscientious objector. But the U.S. Army came a-knocking. 
And at first he resisted the draft. But a Christian American infantry captain convinced him that he needed to fight the good fight of faith, and in this case, literally. So York finally went into the army, and he was sent overseas to France during the First World War. He distinguished himself for his courage, but is at a hill called 223 in France near the end of the war where he became world-renowned. It's fairly well depicted in the film Sergeant York, starring Gary Cooper. Has anybody here seen Sergeant York? Oh, a number of you. Okay. Uh, this film is fairly accurate, so I do recommend it. It was, by the way, the most popular film of 1941 and received eight Academy Awards. So to me, this is kind of a must-see film, all right? Anyway, the film, it is pretty accurate. And folks, here's what happened that day. Uh, York and the rest of his unit were sent out in a reconnaissance in force. But they came head-on, clashed head-on with an entire enemy machine gun battalion. They almost got wiped out to the man. There were eight privates, and at that time, Corporal York, they were all that, was, that were left. Everybody else was dead or wounded. Well, they were given strict orders. They couldn't retreat either, and they weren't going to surrender. But York could not bear the thought of any more of his comrades being killed. So he swallowed hard, told his men to stay where they were, said another quick prayer, and he counterattacked. Three and a half hours later, Sergeant York took out 25 enemy soldiers, captured 29 machine gun positions, and took 132 prisoners. Now, if you think that's hard to believe, you're right, it is. General Pershing thought that was hard to believe. They thoroughly investigated York twice. The second time, they interviewed each of the German officers he had captured. Each one confirmed, very reluctantly, I might add, everything that was being said about Sergeant York. One of the officers was very bitter and said, if we had more men like him, we wouldn't be sitting here right now. Alvin York received more awards and decorations, medals, than any other American during the First World War. He received 49 of them, including the Medal of Honor. But York said, among other things, I believe in continual prayer. A higher power than man guided and watched over me and told me what to do. It was God's power that saved me. But folks, may I slip in a comment here? I hope you don't mind, but it's something that's really burdened me. Um, and it probably doesn't apply to your church. Probably doesn't, okay? But then again, I didn't think it'd apply anywhere. Uh, a number of years ago, I got to be the Northwest Awana Scholarship Camp Speaker. It was great. I loved it. We were there for a week, and uh, we had 425 kids, junior high, senior high. It was great. It really was. Great kids. Cream of the crop, right? Well, uh, I would speak each night, and we had a quiz contest each night. And in the morning, I was asked if I have a Bible study with the graduating high school seniors, the Citation Award winners. Uh, there were, uh, I think, 21 of them. They're all about 18 years old. They're the cream of the crop of the Iwana from their respective churches. I had a certain uh, curriculum, if you will, that I was going to share with all these kids, right? I had to completely change it. I had a survey I put out, and it was anonymous, 20 questions. And I asked questions like, how often do you pray? How often do you read the Bible? Questions like that. I was appalled. I couldn't believe it. For example, the prayer question, the average answer was three times. A week. And I told these kids, you don't know what you're going to do after high school because you have not been talking to the Lord. The Bible says you pray without ceasing. You pray continuously. This should have been three times a day at the least, but three times a week? What's wrong with this picture, folks? Well, forgive me, but you can tell it's been <laughs> burdening me about that. So young people, pray, 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 and when you're done, pray some more, okay? Right? Hello? <laughs> Before you get in trouble. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. Now, York was only human. There are things he didn't like. There were things that made him afraid. And the number one thing he said terrified him the most was, drum roll please, riding a motorcycle. <laughs> How many of you ride a motorcycle? Anybody? Okay, a few of you. You've got more courage than Sergeant York does. Sergeant York co commented, 
he would rather attack another enemy machine gun battalion than ride a motorcycle. And he commented, it was asking too much of God traveling like that. <laughs> Next, moving on, we turn to Courageous Carver. He was born into slavery. He was orphaned in infancy. He suffered from chronic health issues. He stammered. He endured great poverty, hunger, and homelessness. He struggled to be educated, and he faced great prejudice. But by the grace of God, folks, and a whole lot of prayer, George Washington Carver overcame incredible, incredible difficulties and became America's greatest botanist or plant expert, the world's top black scientist. He advanced all kinds of scientific methods like crop rotation. He became a renowned educator, popular speaker, prolific author, award-winning artist, and a concert pianist. And he became a dedicated Bible teacher, staunch creation scientist, generous philanthropist, famed prayer warrior, and devout Christian. Can you say overachiever? George Washington Carver, by the way, folks, did not invent peanut butter. He reinvented it by homogenizing it, and that changed, literally changed history. He did discover over 300 uses for the peanut, including the nougat for the world's greatest candy ever. And what is that, folks? Reese's peanut butter cuffs, of course, right? Oh, oh, have we, have we got a Reese's fan? I knew you looked godly. We have an entire program about Carver, as you might know. We shared it with you a number of years ago. He's one of my favorite Americans. He's an amazing, amazing person. And other, among other things, he told Congress, the Bible tells about the God who made the peanut. I asked him to show me what to do with the peanut, and he did. George Washington Carver, Time Magazine called him the Black Leonardo da Vinci. The New York Times said, what other man has done so much for agriculture and the South? Carver pushed three Ps, positivity, persistence, and prayer. Boy, was he big on prayer. He believed in praying without ceasing. He was famous for getting up at 4 o'clock in the morning and spending two hours in prayer, folks. His colleagues would say, why are you wasting so much time? You could get so much more done. You go, oh, no, I get more done if I do spend two hours in prayer. Washington, George Washington Carver became famous for his, his prayer and slogan sheet. And I was able to finally get a, uh, my hands on a copy of this, and we have a duplicate on the back table there in our little mini George Washington Carver Museum back there. Um, we have a letter that I was able to obtain written by him and his slogan sheet, and there's a few other articles back there. At any rate, he lists his five favorite verses, and he lists a prayer. And at the bottom we read, and may those whom he has redeemed learn to walk and talk with him, not only daily or hourly, but momently through the things he has created. Among other things, he wrote, my lifetime study of nature in its many phases leads me to believe more strongly than ever in the biblical account of creation is found in Genesis 1.27, and God created man in his own image. He was a very staunch creationist. He loved flowers, among other things, and he asked the question, can any of you believe that the miracle of this flower is no more than an accident? George Washington Carver would become terribly famous. He would meet five American presidents. Three of them became close personal friends of his, Theodore Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt, and uh, Calvin Coolidge. We could go on and on about Carver. We do so in our Carver program. The U.S. Navy named two different vessels after him. There are all kinds of monuments, streets, and buildings named after him. Uh, the government came out with various stamps and coins. The fifth national monument to honor an individual was not for another president. It wasn't for Benjamin Franklin. Believe it or not, the fifth national monument after George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Ulysses S. Grant, and Abraham Lincoln, the fifth one was in honor of George Washington Carver. He's almost forgotten today, folks, in our public schools. At the monument, which I highly recommend, but it's way out in the middle of nowhere because the monument is built on the site of the farm where he grew up as a slave boy. There are 36 quotations from Carver that are engraved in various monuments around the facility. 
I counted 17 out of the 36 deal with God or the Bible or Christ or Christians. Anyway, the very first one you come to is this one. How can I be sure that I'm on the right road? In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Now, you must learn to look to him for direction and then follow, and you will never go wrong. And yes, I told those Awana kids about that. Now, here's a little postscript. Somebody asked me why I would include George Washington Carver as a tough guy. Oh, folks, I can't think of too many people who were more of a tough guy. He survived so much, and he would not quit no matter what. But may I add this? Number one, George Washington Carver rose to the rank of captain in the Iowa National Guard. Long story short, he manually, by himself, plowed 17 acres of rocky ground with a plow. And he didn't have a horse, didn't have a cow. He pushed it himself. And then, folks, he was a slender guy, but he loved football and he didn't mind, mind being banged up. And then, folks, guess what? He loved snakes. He had his favorite snake was a six-foot-tall bull snake. And one time, a dignitary came to visit him in his tiny two-room apartment at Tuskegee Institute, and Carver saw this man sit down and go, oh, please, 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 stand up, stand up, stand up. What's wrong? You almost sat on my snake. And the man goes, oh, thank you, you say, oh, I don't care about you, I'm worried about my snake. <laughs> Indiana Jones is afraid of snakes. So that makes him a tough guy, don't you think? But there's one more thing I want to add before we move on. Do you know, ladies, you're going to hate this, do you know what was his favorite food? Gravy. The greasier, the better. And he would put gravy on almost everything. Now, guys, is that manly or what? <laughs> Next, moving on, we turn to the medic on Hacksaw. You ask, how many here have seen Hacksaw Ridge? Okay, a number of you. Uh, the film's about 50% accurate. That's Hollywood for you, which, you know, that's not bad for a Hollywood movie. It depicts the true story of combat medic Desmond Doss during the Second World War in the Pacific Theater of Operations during the Second World War. I read all three books about Desmond Doss. And, yes, Hollywood, they did get some things wrong. For example, folks, he was never arrested, he was never beaten up, he was never incarcerated, and he was never court-martialed. However, the film does a great job of depicting the wonderful Christian testimony and relationship between he and his beloved wife, Dottie, who was a nurse. Furthermore, they do a great job of depicting, for example, how Dottie gave him his New Testament to read. And he became famous for reading that New Testament every morning and every evening, and he prayed, prayed, prayed in between all the time. He became famous for his courage, for his willingness to risk his life. He got in trouble all the time with the doctors because he was considered to be a valuable commodity, a trained medic, but he was not content with staying behind in the hospital. He got out there in the middle of it, in the middle of combat, to save lives. He became heavily decorated, and this is not mentioned in the movie, he became heavily decorated after the Battle of Guam and Leyte, but nobody was prepared for the nightmare of the Battle of Okinawa, especially the attack on Hacksaw Ridge in April of 1945. One American unit after the other, usually a company of men, about 100 to 200 men, one unit after the another, scaled 60 feet of cliff and attacked the enemy fortifications at the top of Hacksaw Ridge. One after the other of these units were forced back with heavy casualties. Doss's unit was ordered in next. At first, things went pretty well, but then there was a massive enemy counterattack. It was a disaster. Almost all of the men in his unit were killed or wounded. The order was given to retreat. Doss stayed behind. He realized there were over 100 wounded Americans that were going to die in the dirt if he didn't do something. So Desmond Doss prayed, prayed, prayed. He started looking for wounded men that he could help. For the next 24 hours, Desmond Doss would pray, please, Lord, help me get one more, one more, one more. He'd find a wounded American, patch him up, drag him to the edge of the cliff and lower him 60 feet down to safety. 
He was alone, unarmed, behind enemy lines, and under constant attack from both Japanese and American artillery. He became known as the miracle on Hacksaw Ridge because of his raw courage, his physical stamina, his devotion to duty, his faith in God, and the army concluded he saved the lives of at least 97 men. And he was only getting started. He went on to distinguish himself later on in the Battle of Okinawa. The actor who plays Desmond Doss is actually English, and he had just recently played the part of, anybody know? Spider-Man! He did two Spider-Man movies. When he saw the script from Hex, for Hexar Ridge, he went to Mel Gibson and said, please, 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 I want to play this part because I want to be a real superhero. If you ever go to San Antonio, Texas, after you've seen the Alamo, my recommendation for a, night, a great place to go is the U.S. Army's Military Medical Museum. It is amazing. And they have a monument to the six combat medics of World War II that were decorated with the Medal of Honor. Here inside we have the same exhibit. And as I said before, I did serve for 35 years in the Air Force Reserve. And before I retired, one of my duties was to write citations for medals. I read a lot of citations. I wrote a lot of citations. I read the citation for Desmond Doss's Medal of Honor. I was stunned. He deserved three medals of honor. But here's something kind of funny. The Army said Desmond Doss saved 97 men, at least that many. Desmond Doss said, no, I'm pretty sure it was only 52. They couldn't agree, so they decided to compromise. <laughs> so the citation says he saved 75 men. Anyway, folks, here's the real Desmond Doss with his wife, Dottie. Here he is being decorated by President Harry Truman with the Medal of Honor, and kind of choked me up the first time I heard about this. Desmond Doss was finally wounded during the battle for Okinawa and was shipped back home to recover. He was called to the White House to a ceremony to receive the Medal of Honor. When his name was called, he got up and began limping down the aisle. President Truman saw him and said, son, you came to our men when they needed you the most. The least I could do is to come to you. Harry Truman stepped down from the platform and met Desmond Doss halfway down the aisle. And folks, you know he's got to be somebody because he has his own action figure. <laughs> Doss, one of his favorite verses was, I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress. My God in him will I trust. Last, certainly not least, we turn to jungle missionaries. It was called Operation Aka. 1956, five very brave American missionaries decided that, that they were going to try and reach with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ one of the most primitive and savage of all tribes in the world, the very fearsome Aka Indians of Ecuador. Things went very, very well at first, and then something hap horrible happened one day. To this day, we don't know for sure why. There are three different theories. One horrible afternoon, the Aka Indians, one by one, killed each one of these men in cold blood. It became known as the Aka Indian Massacre. Left behind were five grieving widows and two little children. This issue of Life magazine has a huge section reporting on the massacre. But a year and a half later, they came up with this issue with a follow-up to the massacre, which became famous around the world. Folks, two American women, young women, whose men were killed by the Aka Indians, went back to that tribe alone and unarmed. And they led half of that tribe to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if that isn't guts, I don't know what guts are, all right? I wouldn't do that. Elizabeth Elliot is on your right there. She led to the Lord the man who murdered her husband. By the way, her nickname among the Aka Indians was Woodpecker. They said she just wouldn't quit. It's conservatively estimated that at least 5,000 young Americans surrendered for full-time missionary service when they were inspired by what these two women did 
and a sacrifice that their five husbands made. There are various good books and articles about the Aka Indians and about Jim and Elizabeth Elliot. My personal favorite, and I believe it's still in print after all this time, called Through Gates of Splendor, written by Elizabeth Elliot. I do recommend if you read this book, you better have a hanky handy, okay? And by the way, she was 28 years old. But you know what? We think of this famous verse when we read about these very brave young American missionaries, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God and to them who are called according to his purpose. Because of people like Jim and Elizabeth Elliot, America is the headquarters for worldwide missions. Our country sends out more missionaries than anybody else. Our country spends more money on missions than the entire rest of the world put together. A while back when I was doing research for this program, I came across this article online from Reuters. Reuters, of course, is a very liberal news organization, but I got choked up. In the article, it said, if you go overseas and you come across a missionary, that missionary is going to be an American. And as I said before, and we shared this program already uh, at the church a number of years ago, folks, I have 14 spiritual reasons why God is not quite done with this country yet and why we can still be proud of, in a good way, the United States of America. As I said, there's still some spiritual tread left in America's tires that God can use if we keep on keeping on for him and our country. Well, there you have it, folks. Those are just nine of the many gutsy guys and gals God has used in this country, especially through the power of prayer. May we have the lights, please. We do hope and pray that everybody here has accepted the Lord Jesus Christ, their creator as Savior, and we do hope and pray that all of us are living for him. We hope that was of, of use to you. And um, uh, see, I'm trying to think. We've done it both ways. How about one or two questions now, and then we're going to have the quiz contest. Any questions or comments before we have our quiz contest? Going once. Going twice. I'm getting off easy. Okay, well, if you would, if you want to, think about some questions. At this time, dun, 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 dun. time for our quiz contest. It's the thrill of victory, the agony of defeat, testosterone versus estrogen. And now, would you give it up for our fearless leader here as he tells us who will be our contestants? We need the ladies over here behind the table, one each behind the black boxes. Guys, over here. Take it away, please. Okay, for the girls, we have... Clara, Paige, Audrey, Madeline, and Anita. For the guys, we have Axel, Davis, all right, uh, no worries, no worries. We'll put in Kim, and uh, let's see, Ryan, and Jonathan. Are we missing a girl? We are missing a young lady. We need five contestants, and we, we've got four. So who's missing in action? Okay, you need a younger young lady. And we need a balance. If we got like three adults on one side, we need three on the other side, okay? Hello, hey, no problem, Madeline, that's no problem. We have Brianna. We have Cherry. We have... Paula's gone. We have Rachel. Yeah! Come on up. I don't feel ready for this at all. I'm not. All right, here are the rules for a quiz contest. Listen up, please. We're going to ask you about 20 questions. When I ask you a question, if you think you know the answer to the question, you must push down on the yellow square on your black box as fast as you can. Everybody do so now. 
Okay, number three for the ladies was the first one to respond. Nice work. She waits until I call upon her. She might think she's the first one if she's not, but in this case, she is. She answers a question, hopefully accurately. She wins a point. She wins a prize. She's a hero. She's a celebrity. She gets a candy. And tonight we're handing out, thanks to the church, all kinds of wonderful candies like Reese's peanut butter cups created by God, Almond Joy, et cetera, et cetera, okay? Everybody starts off with a free candy for being up here, okay? Now, what's your, your name, ma'am? Paige. Paige, okay. Oh, oh yes, I, I didn't recognize you with the glasses on. Excuse me. Okay, let's say Paige got the question wrong. Uh, ah, ah. She loses a point. She loses a prize, and she receives 30,000 volts of electric. No, not really. <laughs> we stopped electrical shock because the burning hair smell was really gross, okay? But... Do not guess, Paige, because you lose a point, you lose a prize. Now, you've been up here before, right? Okay, so be careful before you push on the switch. Make sure you think you know the answer, okay? You got a shot at it, all right? Okay, just a few more rules. If you push on the switch by accident, it's so sad. It's too bad. If you push on the switch, you're answering a question, all right? So don't push on the switch, all right? If Paige gets the question wrong, we will ask it later on, okay? If you know the answer to a question before I can finish the question, you can cut me off. It's very rude, but you can cut me off. But you better make sure you understand that question before you push on that switch, okay? You may uh, answer up to five questions. We do have a cutoff because sometimes we have an Einstein up here who just wipes out everybody, okay? So we do have a five-question maximum, all right? Now, the bad news is, if you run out of candy and you get a question wrong, you're in a hole like the federal government and you go <laughs> extinct. You go extinct. Like, what's your name? Axel. Axel, that's a cool name. I like that name, okay? And anyway, let's say Axel, he did his best. He answers a question, gets it wrong. He loses his starting candy for being up here. Later on, he answers another question. He gets it wrong and Axel's got nothing to give me. He's in the hole. He owes me. Boy. And he goes extinct. He gets to sit down and take a break. All right? So don't get a question wrong, especially if you're out of candy, okay? Um, uh, audience, please don't holler at answers. All right? If you do, I got to throw the question out. And the audience, no booing. Okay? Jesus would never boo, would he? He might go, woo, 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 but he's not going to boo. All right? However, you may cheer for your side. All right? That's okay. Cheering is fine. All right. Those are the rules. They're pretty simple. Lovely ladies, any questions? You understand the rules? Are you ready to crush these boys in Christian love? Yeah! <laughs> I like that. That's good, honey. One more time. Come on, girls. Are you going to crush these boys? Yeah! Uh. Now, may I make a comment before we begin? I was discussing this with uh, one of your workers here. It's been my very extensive experience, I might add, because I've done this hundreds of times, really, hundreds of times, especially for Awana clubs, all right? The girls know the answers, all right? But the girls, I'm sorry, they just don't have the aggressive, belligerent drive that men have got. And ordinarily, some nice young lady like this, what's your name? Clara. Clara. She's probably going to think, I know the answer. I will now push on a switch. Here I go. Now, Axel here, he may or may not know the answer, but he's going to slam my switch like Conan a Barbarian, all right? So, ladies, you've got to become aggressive, belligerent, competitive, okay? Give me a great big grunt. All right, any questions, guys? No? Are we good, guys? Okay, all right. Let's rumble. Let's clear the switches here. Some of these questions are so easy, I'm embarrassed to ask them. Okay. What famous American became almost as famous for being on his knees in prayer as being on his horse in combat? Number five, guys. It's correct. Very good. And the guys draw first blood, ladies. Are you going to put up with this? No.
Oh, you're mean, aren't you? <laughs> All right, tell me please, in my humble opinion, as your guest speaker, I believe that God looked after George Washington, especially in eight different battles, which means that is why I consider George Washington had how many lives? Number one, guys. Nine. Nine is correct. Once again, girls, you know this. You see, you see my point, folks? You see my point? Okay. Tell me, please. Now, this one's tough. Let's see who was paying attention. We had the word up there several times. I mentioned it several times. What, by far, was the most famous battle that George Washington survived against all odds? The what massacre from the French and Indian War? It begins the letter M. Anybody remember? The History Channel has a two-hour special on this. And they, have a, they go to great lengths to try and explain how he survived all those bullets. Anybody? Audience? Monongahela Massacre, Monongahela Massacre, okay. All right, I know that's a hard word, okay. Anyway, moving on here, folks. During the War of 1812, sometimes called our Second American Revolution, we mentioned a very famous naval battle that we believe was miraculously won. This battle occurred on what lake in the Great Lakes? Number two, guys. Lake Erie, lake Erie is correct. Why are you cheering for them? <laughs> you girls are just too nice. She's cheering for the other side. <sighs> Where do you get these people? <sighs> Tell me, please, the American hero of the famous battle of Lake Erie was a commander named Oliver Hazard Wood. Number three. Perry is correct. All right. Nice work here. Okay. Tell me, please, give me the name of many people think was America's greatest mountain man, a famous Christian cartographer, missionary. Give me his name, please. Number five, ladies. Jedediah Smith. Jedediah Smith. Okay, I'll take it. All right. I got to take what I can get, folks. Yay, girls. We got candy. Okay. All right. Tell me, please. Jedediah Smith always carried two books. One was the Journal of Lewis and Clark, and what was the other book? Number two. I'm not, sorry. Number four, girls. The Bible. Woohoo! Come on, give it up for the girls here, folks. Come on. All right. Okay. What usually happens in these quizzes, folks, the girls usually win about 25% of the time. And what happens about halfway through the quiz, they finally get their wind up. But by then it's too late. So, ladies, come on now. You can do this. You can do this. All right. Tell me, please. Uh, keep going here. All right, all right, tell me, please, give me at least the last name of the famous geek and college professor who led a desperate bayonet charge. Number three. Chamberlain is correct during the American Civil War Battle of Gettysburg. Okay. Tell me, please, who remembers what hill his men desperately had to protect at all costs? Number three, guys. Little Round Top is correct. By the way, may I say this? I was kind of surprised. I graduated from U.S. War College, um, and believe it or not, we actually spent some time studying the battlefield tactics of Joshua Chamber Chamberlain. Yep. Uh, anyway, moving on here, folks. Tell me, please, what was the name? Well, let me put it this way. Give me the name of the person who was the angel of the battlefield, the American Nightingale. Yes, number three, ladies. Clara Barton. Clara Barton. Very good. Nice work. Okay. Woohoo. Okay. Tell me, please. I'm going here. 
Clara Barton became famous for many things. Most of all, perhaps, she became the famous founder of what? Wow. Did you see Axel in action? Are you okay? Uh, yeah. American Red Cross. American Red Cross is correct. Give it up for Axel. On my notes, I swear. Okay. Tell me, please. Give me the real name, at least his last name, of the hillbilly hero. Number two, guys. Sergeant York. Sergeant York is correct. Very nice. Yes. Tell me, please. He received more awards and decorations, including the Medal of Honor, 49 awards and decorations. What, is somebody pushing the switch? Oh, somebody's trying to push the switch. <laughs> Number two. Sergeant York. Uh, good answer, but no, sorry. I got to dock you. I'm sorry. <laughs> you see, wait up. Here. Tell me, please, he became the most highly decorated American soldier of what war? Number two. Are you trying to push your switch? Oh, I guess number five beat you. Number five, buddy. Ooh, no, sorry, buddy. Close, but nope. But not. Okay, number two, guys. Number two, guys. World War One. World War One. There you go. Okay. Tell me, please. There's an easy one, but I'm emphasizing this, folks, because it's so important. Sergeant York, and we read this quotation, said, "I believe in continual what? Number one, ladies. Prayer. Really? You sure? Yeah. You're positive. Uh -huh. She's right." <laughs> Nice work. She stood her ground. Woohoo! Right? Okay. I'd wear braces too. I know what it feels like. All right. This, this question just for fun. Let's see who is paying attention, please. Sergeant York, an incredibly brave man, said, however, the number one thing that terrified him was what? Number two, guys. Uh, riding a motorcycle. Riding a motorcycle is correct. All right. Tell me, please, what famous American black scientist reinvented peanut butter? Number three, ladies, is correct. George Washington Carver. Ooh, nice catch. Tell me, please, Desmond Doss became famous as a U.S. combat medic in the Pacific Theater of Operations during the Second World War. He became the became known as the medic on what ridge? Number three, ladies. Hacksaw Ridge during the Battle of Okinawa. Oh, you've been waiting for this question. She's been losing sleep over this question. Your parents must be so proud. Your mother is, okay. All right. Anyway. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm trying to keep an eye on time here. We're running out of time. All right, tell me, please, five brave young Americans wanted to reach what Indian tribe with the gospel of Christ? Number five, ladies. Aka, the Aka Indians of Ecuador. Okay. Give me the name of the lady, the widow of Jim Elliott, who wrote number three, ladies. Elizabeth Elliott is correct. Very good. All right. Tell me, please, this question is just for fun, but it's cute. Tell me, please, the Aka Indians had what nickname for Elizabeth Elliot? Number one. Woodpecker. Woodpecker? Really? You're sure? I don't know. <laughs> She's right. Don't back down. Give her a big hand, folks. All right, okay. Uh, one more question here, all right? Then we better go ahead and uh, call it an evening here, okay? Oh, this one's going to be easy. For all of America's problems, folks, the United States of America sends out more what than anybody else. Number four, ladies. Oh, gentlemen. I'm sorry? Oh, my bad, sorry. Okay, anybody else? Number four, girls. Missionaries, missionaries. All right. 
Well, you know what? I think we better count these. I have a hunch, but let's count them anyway, okay? Would our contestants take a couple steps back or leave your candies on the table because I'm going to count those, okay? All right, step back, guys. I promise you'll be reunited with your candy in a minute, Axel. All right, I'm going to count the candy. In the meantime, we need everybody, including our contestants, to join us with a, a, a version of Dun 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 Come on, come on, I can't hear you. Come on, keep it up, you're sounding great, thank you. Maybe my conjoling did some good. I counted twice. Drum roll, please. After extensive spiritual and intellectual combat, against all odds, we do have a winner, barely. Our brave and noble and brilliant boys have accumulated 13 candies. Give them a big hand. But, and a surprise upset, led by the Holy Spirit, probably not, but anyway, the girls have 14 points. Give it up for the girls. Beauty and brains, girls, remember. Well, you won, okay? Beauty and brains. So thank you, Candy's people. Thank you very much. That was a good quiz. Wasn't that a good quiz? Your church has got some bright kids. Okay, this isn't the Paris Peace Conference. <laughs> All righty, well, we thank you again. Last chance with any questions or comments. It's 7.15. Any questions, comments? Going once, yes, ma'am. Um, no, she wanted a list of the 10 reasons why we can trust in God's existence. Uh, we, we should be able to do something for you. Okay. Anyone else? Going once. Going twice. Going. No, really? Wait a minute. Okay. I got to share with you my favorite example of George Washington being protected by God. Do you want to hear that? Battle of Princeton. Okay. Uh, you know, I was hoping maybe some of the things might have generated some possible questions, and this is one of them. Okay, the Monongahela Massacre is by far the best known example of God preserving George Washington, and it's pretty much a no-brainer when you study this, this event during the French and Indian War. But my favorite, it is the Battle of Princeton, which occurred right after the uh, crossing of the Delaware River, which was followed by the Battle of Trenton. Long story short, this is the first time in what's called a set-piece battle that we have Americans facing the British in Parallel lines, okay? And the Americans were not used to this at all. And most of all, they were terrified of the 18-inch long British bayonet. Scary, scary, scary. So anyway, we've got a line of British crack troops. We've got a line of very green rookie American troops. George Washington cannot get his American troops to advance against the British lines. George Washington rides out into the middle of no man's land in between the two lines of troops. Now, the operational range back then, the British Brown Best Musket, uh, was approximately 80 yards. 50% of the time, that musket would hit something at 80 yards. George Washington got within 30 yards of the British lines. We don't know who fired the first shot, but the, best, the, the next thing we know, both sides opened fire. It's black powder, so there's a ton of smoke, dust, dirt, that kind of thing, can't see a thing. Both sides kept shooting at each other, all right? The dust settles, the smoke blows away, and there's an audible gasp. George Washington is on his horse in the middle of all of this, unscathed. The Americans were so shocked when George Washington gave the order to attack again, they didn't hesitate at all. 
and they won a great victory. Nobody knows how on earth George Washington could have survived that kind of crossfire. Wouldn't you agree? Somebody was looking at him. In fact, let me add this, and then we'll wrap things up. George Washington, we believe, was protected by God, but his horses weren't so lucky. When I visited the Monongahela Massacre site, I went over to the University of Pittsburgh, and I found out something interesting. They did a lot of research on George Washington in combat. And they concluded, yes, George Washington, he really got away with it all, but not his horses. Folks, can you guess how many horses, according to the University of Pittsburgh, quote, were shot out from under George Washington in combat? Okay, he says nine. Nine-ish. <laughs> he should be a politician. Yes, right here. Eleven. Four. Yes, sir. Sixteen. Yes. Twelve. You're way off. Folks, George Washington, in his various battles, had 26 horses shot out from under him. How many think George Washington had somebody looking out after him? And apparently the protection stopped at the saddle. <laughs> we want to thank you for coming tonight. I'd be happy to take your questions or comments afterwards. Once again, we hope and pray everybody here has accepted Christ as Savior, and we hope and pray that all of us are living for him. And young people in particular, remember, pray, 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 and then what? That's right. Thank you. Uh, may God bless you. May God bless America. May God bless Israel. And should I close in a prayer or do we have a message from our sponsor? We have a message from our sponsor. Give him up. Okay. Give it up for him. Now give it up for him. Thank you, Dr. Tom Hoyle. Their notes. Oh. What? Is that how they won? Both sides had notes. Imagine falling off a horse 26 times. That's a brutal fall. Um, so if you thought that what Tom, if you think that what Dr. Tom does is important, uh, we have these envelopes in the back. Not that. Which pocket is it in? There it is. Have these envelopes in the back. Write it out to Tom, and then the check can go to NKBC. But the envelope says Tom Hoyle. It will go to him to support his ministry. He can continue doing this. Uh, he's been doing this for 38 years. Uh, about 4, 000, more than 4,000 times he's done this. So continue supporting him by giving tonight. Uh, and let's close in prayer. Lord, thank you for, again, for Dr. Tom and all the, all the work he's put into this. Um, we just thank you for all, the, all of the... Um, wonderful things you've done throughout history, Lord, that, that are revealed when we, when we dig deeper, Lord. Thank you that Dr. Tom has put in the time, effort, and energy into digging deeper, Lord, revealing these truths to us um, about, about our forefathers um, and foremothers, Lord. I pray tonight that you would uh, send us off with a new courage, a new hope, um, and a new strength in you, Lord, that, that we can trust you. Uh, there are so many more facts, Lord, um, that Dr. Tom has shared over the years than he shared tonight. Lord, it, I pray you would bring those to mind um, as, we, as we go into the world, as we interact with people who don't know you, Lord, we would bring your truth to them. Um, thank you again for, for bringing us here tonight to hear this wonderful message. You know, I pray. Amen. Okay, uh, we are going to do uh, the setup of the chairs and the tables downstairs for the women's ministry as we normally do on Sunday nights starting now. So let's go downstairs uh, if you're in the youth group.